are listening to Natural Resources University. In this podcast network, our hosts are university researchers and extension specialists, opening your gateway to the science of natural resource management. Welcome to Habitat University. This podcast is your source for the science behind wildlife habitat management and is part of the Natural Resources University Podcast Network. We're your host, Jared Brook. And I'm Adam Janke, and we're both biologists and extension wildlife specialists. If you're interested in wildlife habitat management or looking for ways to improve your property for wildlife, this is the podcast for you. So join us as we talk with researchers, managers, and landowners all about the latest research and the ins and outs of wildlife habitat management. Okay, Jared, last episode, I said that I would never be swayed by the outcome of some unscientific Twitter poll, but of course I'm going to take that back. I think, I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty compelled by the outcome of our super scientific Twitter poll that we used last week to settle this dispute about what an invasive species is or is not and whether it has to be a native species because the outcome for the listeners not on Twitter was 73 votes, seven abstaining and 40 on team Adam. An invasive species is, uh, has to be a, uh, does not have to be native or exotic to be cut. Yeah. It doesn't have to be an exotic species. So, uh, yeah, so I'm actually feeling pretty good about the outcome of our Twitter poll. What are you thinking? So I got trumped on the Twitter <laughs> poll, obviously, and I had to eat a little bit of crow because I, I, I said in the episode that I think that when asked, people would agree that an invasive species has to be non-native. But just like you, I'm uh, sticking my feet in the ground and I am, I'm burying them and I'm, I'm staying with my position. Oh, geez. Well, you had good company. There were 26 people that said that were on Team Jared. That's- and there, there were some really good comments. And I think a lot of it has to do with... Uh, going with kind of common definitions from federal and state agencies about what is a invasive species. So it has to be non-native it has to cause harm. That's a lot of what the state agencies and, and federal agencies use um, as their definition. And to me, the, the problem with native species being included in, the, in that invasive category is that I think oftentimes it, it gives people then a, a negative perception of those native species and kind of brings to mind that they need to like eliminate that species or like completely eradicate it, that it's not a part of that ecosystem. But I think there's some really good comments that talked about, you know, aggressive natives. They are part of the ecosystem, but we have chosen to control them for some reason, right? We're, we can control them and manage them because we need to do, um, preserve or conserve an ecosystem, but they're still part of it. It's just, there's something missing like fire or grazing that's allowing them to expand. Yeah. Maybe yeah. we so, need to, to, to throw it to our guests to I see. I was thinking, I was in full disclosure here. We've already had a, a preview of what our esteemed guest this week, Dr. Liz Flaherty thinks. So uh, Dr. Flaherty, what's your opinion on our one more vote in our Twitter poll? Well, you know, when I was listening to that episode of the podcast, I was thinking back to what, I was taught in my wildlife management courses, and there was clearly this um, definition in exotic species and an exotic invasive species. So um, I agree that, you know, there can be these natives that could in some situations be considered um, invasive. Okay. So thank you very much. So I'm, I'm gonna, not going to reveal. I'm going to re- reveal a little bit of information. And Adam, I talked about this earlier. There's very like east west divide. Very much. And so. Dr. Flaherty did. Uh, what you know, Dr. Flaherty, where were you? Uh, did you <laughs> do, did you do your training? Most of my training was at the University of Wyoming. Okay. Yeah. So well, there seemed to be like an east west divide. And we predicted I, that. And I will seed some ground in that. I know for a fact that if, if I went into a extension event or a talk with, uh, you know, ranchers or, ran, or range scientists or rangeland owners, and I said, well, technically, eastern red cedar is not an invasive because it's native, and so it's a native aggressive, I, I 
fully admit that I would probably lose a lot of credibility with that audience, right? They're going to be like, yeah. get back to your Ivy Tower. You don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. So I think there is a lot to say that you have to know your audience, right? And you have yeah. to to be able to kind of s- to speak the language that they're familiar with and use terms that, that are familiar with them. So that being said, I will cede some ground on that, that maybe there's a little, a little more wiggle room than I initially gave credit. Okay. We're going to take that. I'm not going to gloat too much, <laughs> uh, but we do appreciate the people that waited. We had some fun discussions on social media and things. And, and so actually uh, that was, this is not the purpose. Gloating is not the purpose of today's episode. Rather, uh, review and reflection is the purpose of today's episode. And so we're excited to have the listeners back uh, and joining us. And, and we've actually already heard from our guests. We, uh, in settling this dispute, thought we'd benefit from one more opinion of a scientist in the discipline. And so, um, but we'll form, more formally introduce Dr. Flaherty now. Uh, and what we want to do in this episode is uh, this is our 12th episode of the podcast, and this is the last of what we're calling season one. Um, we don't have like a formal title for what season one was, but from the beginning, Jared and I have been thinking about season one as like a static or relatively timeless account of the key principles and uh, topics in wildlife habitat management. And we wanted to basically get on the same page about technical definitions and uh, important topics and important resources and things like that, that anybody could use hopefully across the country uh, or even more broadly. And so uh, that's what we've tried to do. And in thinking about how to wrap it all up, we thought we ought to get a grade on this thing. We ought to figure out how we performed. And so what we did is we found Dr. Flaherty who teaches wildlife habitat management in a program that Jared and I are both alums of, uh, the wildlife program at Purdue University. And uh, we wanted to talk to Dr. Flaherty about her approach to teaching wildlife habitat management, the same thing we've done in the last 11 episodes. And in doing so, we'll probably, or hope to review some of the key terms and topics that we've discussed, and also to um, try to maybe cover some ground that we didn't cover some of the things that we missed uh, on the exam, so to speak. So hopefully we uh, catch everything here at the end and and, uh, wrap things up. And then we're really looking forward to season two uh, coming to your feed soon. So uh, Dr. Flaherty, uh, welcome to the podcast. And please uh, share with us a little bit about your background and your position at Purdue uh, for the listeners that uh, don't know who you are. Well, thanks, Adam and Jared, for inviting me. I really appreciate it. So um, I've been at Purdue for nine years, or this is my ninth year, and uh, my title is Associate Professor of Wildlife Ecology and Habitat Management. Um, I got an undergraduate degree in wildlife and fisheries biology and management from the University of Wyoming, and then did a master's in biology at um, Southeast Missouri State, and then went back to the University of Wyoming for my PhD in zoology and physiology. And um, while I was at the University of Wyoming, I did a lot of work uh, in collaboration with the U.S. Forest Service, both in Wyoming and Southeast Alaska, evaluating questions related to um, forest management and habitat management and wildlife responses to uh, habitat management. So at Purdue, I teach this fall course, which is wildlife habitat management. Um, in addition to a wildlife techniques course and a week of our summer um, field practicum course that we take students to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan to do. Great. So you should really be able to provide us with a, with a grade on how we did covering the various topics that um, are all involved in wildlife habitat, habitat management. So I guess as we start, I'd really like to get your thoughts on like, what are some of like the key concepts, terms, information, however you want to put it, what are kind of the things that you hope that undergraduate wildlife students that are going on to be wildlife biologists, what do you hope they gain from taking a course like habitat management? Well, one of the things I start the course with is that is sort of an explanation of why I really like working in habitat management. And the reason is that it takes all of these different ecological topics and fields and combines them together 
um, to solve problems or issues um, that we're experiencing in the wildlife field. And so it can be a really rewarding field to go into. Also, it can be a very challenging field because you have to know a lot about a lot, I think, to do a good job with habitat management. Liz, I really like what you said there because I think you're right in that it does bring a lot of different fields of ecology all together. And I do think it's really rewarding as well. And that's why I like it because it's it's interesting and fun to see how you can make changes on the landscape and see how wildlife respond. And that's like kind of where the, the art and science come together. So can you explain a little bit more about what you meant by like how you try to get across to the students that you bring a lot of different fields of ecology together when you talk about habitat management? Sure. So, you know, we, I use this really as a, a way to show them how all of the coursework they're taking um, complements each other and then can be used to solve these big habitat questions. So we talk about uh, the ecological theories that they learn in their intro ecology course, like, you know, understanding the difference between R and K selection and species and uh, things like um, ideal free distribution theory and just those basic theories that they learn, but generally are given in a really broad um, way. And so they don't necessarily understand how it applies to what they want to do in wildlife. Um, I also talk about how, you know, in habitat, we really have to understand the natural history of the animals that we're working with, that we're managing habitat for. And so all of those uh, vertebrate ecology classes they take, their, you know, ornithology, mammalogy, herpetology um, coursework really applies to what we do because we need to know the resources and um, conditions that these animals ideally need. Um, you know, behavior can play a huge role too in how we manage habitat. We talk about how understanding um, state and federal policy and administration affects how and what we can do on the ground. And then, you know, of course, there's always a, a large amount of um, math and stats applications that go um, into managing habitat. And so you really may not necessarily, I think, need to memorize a lot of information, but to be an effective habitat biologist or manager, you need to know how to tie all this information together, how to find the specific information you need, um, and then make important decisions based on all of those inter interacting disciplines and fields. And of course, I didn't mention botany, but botany is obviously extremely important in addition to their wildlife courses. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for that explanation. And as you were think, as you were talking there, I was thinking uh, in the back of my mind, you know, how some of the different different uh, themes and, and coursework that you were talking about, how that fits into some of the episodes that we had, like, you know, botany. We had an episode all about plants. We had one about invasive species. Of course, that's really important. We've talked about some of those concepts, maybe not the specific ones that you mentioned, but we talked about things like Lieberg's law, the limit of the limiting and carrying capacity on all those kind of f foundational concepts and how that fits into habitat management. And then also, you know, we discussed all about how understanding species and their needs is important because habitat so species specific. Um, and so I, th I think it's good, really good to, to hear about how you can bring all those stuff, all that stuff together for habitat management. I think too, you know, one of the reasons that this is a fun class to teach, and I hope it's also a fun class for the students to take, is how applied and hands-on it is. So for example, our lab in two weeks is a, an introduction to heavy equipment. So our property manager brings all of these tractors and implements and shows the students what each of those do. And then we talk about, you know, how you would use, uh, like, you know, in our department, we're all very fond of the the bobcat with the fecon head for the the incredible amount of work it can do in a minimal amount of time in invasive species control. But that's also really important because a lot of our students are now coming from non-rural agricultural backgrounds. And so they, 
really have not seen a tractor up close or um, even a bobcat up close. So it's a nice way for them to see and get you know, their hands dirty planting trees or even learning how to drive a tractor. Um, so yeah, I, I really enjoy that aspect of the course too. I think that gradient of a course covering everything from the operation of a bobcat with a fecon head to understanding the application of the ideal free distribution theory from ecology is a pretty perfect characterization of how you started talking about why it is that you find habitat management so interesting because you apply these lessons from so many different disparate disciplines. So I think that's really cool. It sounds like an awesome class that you teach there at Purdue. What is something that you think the students routinely get hung up on or a concept that you end up spending a lot of extra time helping uh, students or maybe even graduates uh, think about in their habitat management? I think initially the thing that they really get hung up on is um, just how much information goes into making these decisions. But I think too, what the students tend to struggle with are things related to um, using math and quantitative methods, because you know, even if you're trying to calculate a concentration for an herbicide, there's math involved. And uh, I see a lot of students that just are really intimidated by math, even when it's relatively easy and you can do a quick equation um, in Excel. Um, they struggle with that. And I think that, you know, a lot of people struggle with that aspect of, of what we do. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Uh, I remember being the very naive high schooler that I was and knowing that I wanted to go into to some sort of wildlife management. I was like, oh, I don't need to take calculus. Like, eh, psh, you don't need to take that. I don't need to know math. I want to be out doing stuff in the field. And boy, was I wrong. Um, I certainly don't necessarily use calculus a lot, at least in the, my day-to-day -day job, but I use algebra mm -hmm. and, and geometry and all that stuff fairly regularly. Just like you said, with figuring out herbicide um, calculations, even you know being able to convert from metric to imperial and being able to convert from like ounces to gallons. So knowing all those units of measurements and things, and then, you know, if, if we're planting seed, knowing the correct seeding rate and how to, you know, convert units and things, all that stuff's really important that you don't really get a good grasp for until you like get out mm -hmm. there and do it. And I think some of our students, they take calculus and they take the intro stats class and then they're, they think I'm done with that. I got through it. I'm not going to have to deal with that again. And then we start in the first week with a chi-square analysis, looking at habitat selection. Um, so they realize pretty quickly that they might have to, to think about those um, stat methods they learned again. But I think it's good too, because, you know, in a lot of those um, basic courses, they're teaching us skills and not necessarily using wildlife examples. And so when we can have the opportunity, like in this class, to reteach things, but show them how it applies to all of those examples that you just gave, it makes it more real. And I think it makes it easier in the long term too, when it's meaningful. I think that that discussion on math and, and the application of some of those sort of basic concepts is really interesting. And I'm trying to think, we did kind of talk a little bit about that. We talked about that, Jared, maybe the most in the Moneyball episode where we were, you know, talking about, you know, using critical thought and in some cases, uh, statistics or mathematics to try to draw valid inferences and not, you know, over putting too much weight on our, um, on our observations in thinking about the biased process that, that, um, that our observations come from. Another thing that we've spent a lot of time talking about on the podcast is the other thing that you mentioned being hard for students to parse in your class, which is this business of just making decisions. Uh, and I think in this first season, we've spent a lot of time talking about that because to say you manage a property for wildlife habitat is functionally meaningless because you could manage a property for wildlife habitat by putting in 
a gravel parking lot that a kill deer would be content with, or you could manage a property for wildlife habitat by, I don't know, uh, clear cutting or whatever, you know, a, a range of options. So I'm curious, and you, and you mentioned that hard decision making, uh, being something that students get stuck on. So I'm curious, what do you tell your students about that? The reality of th- these are hard decisions and there are all these trade-offs to make, like, how do you approach that? Well, so we have a a topic coming up soon on adaptive management. And so I think this is a nice way of um, teaching them that we make hard decisions, but if we're using the adaptive management cycle where we're making decisions and then we're collecting information and monitoring how it goes, and then we can revisit those decisions and potentially change some things like in the next season or the next round of management, um, that works, you know, pretty well for habitat management. So even though it is at times hard to get started, if you know that there's an opportunity for adjusting your plan, I think that sort of makes it easier for people in general, um, to finally take that step and make that decision. That's a really important concept, even for landowners to be able to utilize and understand. Cause I think a lot of times, you know, we, we think of decisions like very linearly, like we make a decision, we have an expected outcome, and then we just keep proceeding on. But there's all these variables that are, that are going to potentially change where we we have to revisit the decision we made and, you know, do something differently based on the outcome. Like I'm thinking about in my mind, like, you know, lots of times you can do things like timber harvest on your property to create habitat for various wildlife species. But then you then you throw in things like invasive species and the outcome that you expect based on you know, doing using the tool of the ax to create habitat for for whatever wildlife species you're interested in it, you may not get to that expected outcome um, that you had hoped for because of throwing in things like invasive species so being able to adapt and say okay i did this timber harvest it didn't work out exactly like i thought i was going to now I have to adapt and have to think about how am I going to control that invasive species, or even beforehand thinking about how I'm going to how am I going to control that invasive species before I even take the next action. Action, but having that kind of circular thinking rather than a linear decision making, where that adaptive management really comes into play is important even from a landowner. Oh, absolutely! I think that can be where it can be challenging sometimes with like farm bill projects, CRP projects, where the prescriptions are pretty, can be very strict. And so you, it's sometimes harder to respond, but when you're doing it on private land and you're not um, using some of those programs, you have more flexibility in how you can respond and what you do. Yeah, I think everybody wants a cookie cutter recipe for or, or for how to do something, right? I get that, I get questions all the time what do I need to plant in my food plot? Or what, do I, what kind of native grasses or forbs do I need to plant? And I think something that Adam and I have talked a lot about is, you know, we get a typical biologist's answer of it depends, right? There's lots of factors that go into that and being able to adapt and, and do things based on the conditions on your site and weather and all that stuff is really important to be able to, to meet the mm-hmm. outcome you want. Well, and the, you know, that's why, Students, I think, can struggle in this class initially because in a lot of the classes they've taken up to this point in their college career, everything is pretty cookie cutter and, and, you know, has hard lines. And that is a would be a tough way to to do habitat management. That's what we call the art of wildlife habitat management. It's certainly a theme that we've talked about a fair bit, and it's really neat to hear you think about. Uh, how it is that you teach that to your students. And then I think, Jared, maybe we've just introduced a concept that we missed in our first first season here, the notion of adaptive management. I think that was a really neat discussion about what exactly adaptive management is, and I think that's a topic we'll have to revisit in a future uh, uh, episode uh, to really kind of dig in on how wildlife habitat managers are applying the principles of, of adaptive management to achieve their outcomes. So that was a really nice example. Another, so we just, we just lost some points there. <laughs> we, so we, so I don't know what our grade is, but we're going to just have to keep track. I have a feeling we're going to, we're going to come across a couple of other ones, especially with my next question. My next question is perhaps reluctantly, because I, you've already mentioned 
two concepts that we definitely didn't cover, the notion of R and K selection and the ideal, uh, the ideal free distribution theory uh, that I can definitely see as being relevant to understanding and thinking about how we do wildlife habitat management. I'm curious what you think are some of the other big ecological theories or concepts that are really critical for students to understand and think about as they go out and try to manage wildlife habitat to achieve certain outcomes on a property they're responsible for. So one of the other theories that we talk about in uh, the habitat management class is metapopulation theory, which is really critical at this point because it deals with understanding how uh, we manage fragmented populations because the metapopulation theory um, explains how you can have um, essentially population islands in a, a landscape and there's dispersal between those islands. Um, because at this point, most, if not all of our wildlife habitats are fragmented to some degree. And so managing for species dispersal among those habitat islands is really important. Okay. That's, that's definitely a concept that I think we've not paid enough attention to. Jared, would you agree with that assessment? Yes, yeah. I would agree. Yeah. Absolutely. So I always, one thing, um, we should dig into these words. We should dig into the notion of a meta population. We should dig into what dispersal means and what fragmentation means. Cause I, it does occur to me that that's something that, uh, we probably could have committed an episode to because yeah, I would definitely agree. It's really central to our management, just sort of a totally applied example of this to launch the discussion is I don't know how many times I have people say, on my farm in 1970, we had X, probably Northern Bob Whites and listeners excuse us, but we got, we have to uh, use Northern Bob Whites as the example, as we tend to do in this podcast. And, and then I have this happen at a field day, or I have this happen in just communication after a presentation or something with a, with a landowner or a manager. And they say, 1970, I had northern bobwhites on my farm, and I have the just perfect habitat for northern bobwhites, and I don't understand they're not there, why they're not there. And then I ask them where their farm is, and I realize that they're 100 miles from the nearest sustainable population of northern bobwhites. And the joke, we never actually say this, but what we often want to say is, well, if you want to have northern bobwhites on your farm, sell your farm and buy one 100 miles to the south. Because of the outcome of habitat fragmentation and metapopulations that have led to, in this case, range contraction, or like the um, there just isn't enough habitat on the landscape to sustain a population of northern bobwhites in the way that there was in the 1970s. And so even if your farm was just an oasis of perfect bobwhite habitat, if there aren't bobwhites within a suitable dispersal distance, they're not going to be found on the farm. So I think that's sort of an applied example that it's something I deal with all the time and we should have addressed it by this time on the episode or on the, the podcast, but I'm glad we're talking about it now. So what is, break it down for us. What are the key terms and key things that we have to understand about managing wildlife habitat and wildlife populations in these fragmented landscapes? Well, the, the key variable in these, if you want to maintain these fragmented populations is dispersal. So you have to have movement of individuals between these different, you know, small populations because you can experience localized extinction from a variety of things in those smaller populations. Maybe you have a really effective mm -hmm. predator that moves in and just wipes the entire population out, or you have a disease that comes through. And so if that happens, if you don't have new individuals that disperse or move in, you're, you're not going to have a new population there. So the metapopulation theory is also referred to as this blinking light type of population model where you have populations that blink on and then there's some sort of disturbance and they'll blink off. But if you have dispersal, they'll eventually turn on again. And so a lot of times, if we want to make sure that we're maintaining dispersal, we have to then think about 
creating some sort of pathway or corridor, you know, between those different population fragments or habitat fragments. And so in a, an agricultural landscape in the past, you know, those fence rows were really effective at creating these, these dispersal habitats for animals to move through. And there, there was some amount of cover um, for them as they did that. Yeah, so that brings up this notion or a common term that we think about, and I don't know if we've used it in the podcast. So another thing that we maybe missed in our first season is the notion of connectivity, um, basically the ability for an animal to move through a landscape. And and just like a lot of the natural history or behavioral variation that we see among different species, we see different needs for connectivity. Um, and so is there – what's your thinking on understanding – those barriers or measuring, like if, if a farmer wants to know whether it's even plausible or excuse me, a landowner or something wants to know if it's even plausible to have a certain species, what do they need to understand about that species ecology or the neighbor's land or the neighbor's neighbor's land to be able to inform their own approach to habitat management? Well, there's a couple, not even a couple, there's a lot of things to think about. So, you know, one um, variable would be animal density because there are some species that occur at very low densities. Um, so you're, you're gonna need a lot more area to support individuals of that wildlife species. Um, and then there's related to that is, you know, knowing how they move around like home range size to what sort of area do they cover um, and then thinking about identifying potentially a source population. So is there a fragment or a, a piece of habitat somewhere in the vicinity that you might be able to eventually attract that wildlife species from to occupy your property based on, um, characteristics that you develop, you know, on your, on your land that you're managing. Um, often, you know, juveniles, as they get to be um, a little bit older, get kicked out from um, being around mom. And so those are individuals that start roaming around to look for um, suitable habitat. And in that sort of situation, you might be able to attract, to attract some of those um, individuals to use your property if you have the correct habitat conditions. So what? What you're talking about there, a couple different thoughts. Like, you know, we oft, you often hear people use the term and relate it back to field of dreams, right? If you build it, they will come. And I think what you're trying to get across there is if you build it, they will come is dependent on a lot of yeah. different things, right? And there's actually been some really interesting research come out the last few years that talks about that and bring it back to Bob White's, Adam, about how like the value of some of those conservation practices that are put in on, the, on private land specifically, the, the closer they are to that source population of, of Bob Whites, you know, obviously the more valuable they are. And like you go out a certain distance based on how Bob Whites disperse and things. And the farther you go out, the less valuable those things are to, to that source population because they can't make it there. And then at some point it just falls off to where just by adding that, that, the, the new field that you add to promote Bob White is just too far away from um, that source population to be of any benefit. And I'll try to link to some of the research that has been into this. And I can't remember the, the, that distance off the top of my head, but that's, I think it's really important to talk about when we talk about connectivity. But the follow-up to that is, and I dealt with this a lot when I was um, working with private landowners in, in Kentucky and other states, who are interested in managing wildlife is now I often get the question of like, well, if I do this, how likely is it that I get Bob White back? And, you know, there's different ways you can answer that. It's hard to say exactly. Obviously we we'll talk about, well, it depends on how close other, other species or other individuals are to your site. But like the, the other way out to answer that question is, you know, you may not ever get Bob White's back, but it doesn't mean that putting in, that piece of cover, that piece of uh, that, that new native grass planting or whatever, it doesn't mean it doesn't have benefits to other wildlife species, right? So 
You may not get Bob White's back because it's too far away, but there's also value to that piece from a variety of different wildlife species that may have different home ranges, different dispersal distances and, and stuff like that. So the alternative in that case to selling the farm is to changing your expectation. Exactly. I think that that's a really neat example. And the other thing that I was thinking about in this discussion is, uh, especially with what you were saying here at the end, Jared, is that there's policy implications to this. So Dr. Flaherty, you introduced the notion that wildlife habitat management intersects all these things from ecological theories all the way up to uh, decisions that are made in Washington, D.C. And Jared, when you were talking about this Bob White dispersal thing, I was thinking about like private lands uh, programs like Working Lands for Wildlife uh, with the Natural Resources Conservation Service and other programs that um, are policy built on this understanding of the science and ecology of different species. So kind of a neat uh, example to sort of um, reinforce that notion of how multidisciplinary wildlife habitat management can be. Yeah, and to kind of piggyback off of that, talking about the multidisciplinary, as you know, we've had this discussion about landscape connectivity and metapopulations, it really pulls in how important the entire field of landscape ecology is into uh, wildlife, wildlife habitat management. So Liz, are there, are there certain concepts beyond connectivity from a landscape ecology standpoint that you talk about in your class that are important for um, the students to know or even landowners to know? Well, I think, you know, one of the things we talk about in the first week is um, in relationship to landscape ecology is the concept of scale. So you can manage things at the microhabitat scale on your property all the way up to trying to plan um, for the landscape level. And, you know, as you move up in scale, the complexity def definitely will increase. But I think for this class, that's kind of the broader limit of what we talk about in terms of landscape ecology. That concept of scale is a really interesting one and has me thinking about even bigger picture things beyond basic landscape ecology and just other things that intersect our wildlife habitat management outcomes and uh, our management decisions. And that is the scale of things that we have no control whatsoever over. Um, and you're, I'm interested in how you present this. I could think, you know, a land owner or manager could have outright control, for example, on like food production, say, um, in a food plot, particularly, um, but less control over what, you know, the neighbors are doing or what uh, the neighbor's neighbors are doing and so on and so forth. So what about like big picture factors like um, species population trends or disease or climate change? Like, do you talk about those kind of topics in your wildlife habitat management class? We do talk about those topics. So, you know, in terms of disease, there are habitat features that can either promote disease, like have a negative effect on your wildlife population because it's increasing animal density and then you have increased disease transmission. Um, you know, we just talked about the challenges with managing bighorn sheep out west where you have bighorn sheep habitat that is in the same area where there's grazing leases with the Forest Service, for example. And so you have bighorn sheep interacting with domestic sheep and then the bighorns, which are super susceptible um, to the bacteria that causes pneumonia, um, get really sick and you can lose an entire herd, you know, just because of that type of habitat interaction. Um, and then absolutely in terms of climate change, we talk about that, especially in the last half of the class where we really focus on um, topics related to managing different types of habitat. Like we, you know, go through managing um, Western, you know, dry grasslands and prairie, um, managing our, our more wet Eastern grasslands, um, managing wetland habitats. Um, and then we also, you know, increasingly talk more and more about trying to manage urban wildlife habitat as we learn more about how wildlife are using 
urban areas, especially in the US, and there's a ton of work going on about um, urban wildlife in the Midwest. Um, and all of that has a really broad, you know, even beyond landscape um, level scale because of the, the issues. Climate change is a global issue. It's affecting worldwide populations. So those, those are some of those like uh, grand challenges that are obviously affecting way more than uh, students or landowners and things you can, you can control. But I think it's important to talk about those because those are gonna, going to affect species distribution and what species are where and uh, from a wildlife standpoint, even, even from a plant standpoint as well, um, how you know, plant composition may change as a result of like the climate envelope changing in certain areas. So that adds a new, a new layer to habitat management. Um, you know, related to climate change, there's, there's a ton of work being done right now on, on range expansions or contractions of different species. Like um, coyotes are now seen in areas where they weren't typically um, observed. And that's kind of this, um, complicated story that involves probably climate change, but also predator management and changes in landscape use. That's an interesting connection back to a couple of concepts that we've, we've talked about. One concept being uh, adaptive management, where there's going to be things that come up that you just couldn't have anticipated. And you could imagine that being like a deer manager in the Southeast that, um, you know, 20 years ago, couldn't imagine coyote predation pressures and now they have to confront that and think about their wildlife habitat management for say uh whitetail fawn production or something and then this other one i was thinking about was the intersection between scale and climate change because you know some ecosystems or some wildlife habitat management practices we do just you know year over year impacts but a lot of the work that folks do like for example in forested environments are you know we're making decisions today about what the forest is going to look like in 100 years and climate change could really throw a wrench in that our understanding or our predictions or abilities ability to predict that so what do you tell students about that uncertainty i mean i could almost see people becoming despondent over the prospect of all that uncertainty and not really wanting to move forward with habitat management decisions today in future conditions so what what do we do about that or what's your lesson for that? Oh, I think that's a, a great point because, you know, you do in teaching these topics have to really toe that line between being almost too negative and depressing about the message that you're giving because, you know, like with some of those uh, fires that we're seeing out West, there are questions about whether that habitat will ever look the same. Um, because of the the issues that have um, that have arisen because of climate change, but I think you know if the goal is that we're managing based on the best information that we have, and we're making decisions based on science. Um, you know, I think that's really what I focus on trying to manage for what we know now and trying to incorporate some of the modeling that's um, being done right now to try to predict what these changes could mean and how different management practices could help or hinder different um, different habitat changes. So that's a really good point, you know, managing based on the best information we have, but also considering the the changes that we're likely to see. And I definitely think that Adam, we're gonna to have to do a follow-up episode on how we can incorporate some of that information into making habitat management decisions, right? Yeah, um, I think so. I think we just identified another concept that we uh, haven't spent enough time <laughs> on and understand the habitat management on the centuries time scale. And what should we be doing now for future generations? I think that's definitely gonna be an interesting topic and one we haven't touched yet and appreciate you bringing that up dr flaherty liz i really appreciate you joining us for this and i think it was really good because it really made me think about how many different fields are brought into habitat management right 
it's it's really kind of eye opening to see like how much information and things go into the decisions that we make and how it brings in all these dis really all these disciplines because um, I think it's really cool that all that stuff's incorporated into into habitat management and even from like a, a landowner's perspective, right? Like they may not ever consider that all of these different disciplines have to be brought together to make these decisions on their, on their properties. Right. I think it's really good to think about and, and think as you think the, through those decisions, think about all that goes into it. Yeah. I mean, that's why, like I've said, I really enjoy this and working in this field. You know, one of the other things I tell my students most of us go into the wildlife field because we're really passionate about wildlife and natural resources and we want to make a difference. And I think if you pursue a career that really focuses on habitat, you probably can have the biggest impact on conservation and wildlife populations than most of our, our other um, wildlife focused disciplines. That's great. It's always good to hear. And that's uh, why I like habitat management, right? It, and, it, and I think you can have a big difference and it's, you can see the difference um, and you can measure the, di the difference, you know, at relatively it, between short and long time frames, right? So you can kind of see your results as you go, whereas some of the other types of disciplines that you may not see those changes for long, long time periods. Yeah, I think that's a really empowering perspective that you know, should appeal to somebody that's doing wildlife habitat work in their backyard to somebody that's doing it on their farm or property or public land or anything. It's, it is pretty cool. It's a fun way to make a difference on uh, a bunch of different scales and it's really re rewarding work. So, um, and, and that's been reflected, you know, throughout this, this first season of our, of our podcast, we've talked to a lot of people and the common theme I think is like a passion for wildlife habitat management and, and seeing these outcomes and just kind of doing right by the land. So I think that's really neat. And it's really neat to hear your passion and how you convey that to your students. So I think we just have one last question and our question for you is, um, what's your number one takeaway? Like, what do you hope a student coming out of your class is thinking about or applying in their work or still, you know, talking about in 10 years after professional practice in wildlife and wildlife habitat management, I'm wondering what that key takeaway is. And then I'm going to throw that same question to Jared, uh, to sort of say, what's the key takeaway from this season or what's the key takeaway that we want, you know, listeners to kind of think about as well for, in, as we sort of look towards wrapping up season one of Habitat University. So Dr. Flaherty, first to you, what do you, what do you hope your students are still thinking about in 10 years after having taken your class? I really hope that they're thinking about, you know, how to make decisions based on the best science. And so I really focus very little in my courses on memorizing information, but more like if you have questions, how do you go about answering those questions? And, you know, for landowners who are interested in um, doing habitat work on their properties, if they know who to go to to answer some of these tougher questions, I think that that's probably one of the most important um, takeaways from like training future habitat managers. One takeaway that I, hope, that I hope people take away from this season and from our discussion today is that every species is different, right? So whatever species you're interested in is gonna have different habitat needs and you need to be able to understand those needs in order to make those decisions um, like Liz is talking about. And so you need to be able, be able to find where those resources are and and learn more information about it. We also need to understand that because of each species difference, there's going to be trade-offs, right? So there's going to be decisions you make that are going to impact one species positively may impact another species differently. So always thinking about those trade-offs so that you don't get so tunnel focused on one species that you don't see the implications for other species on your property. So thinking, have a clear understanding of, of those kind of trade-offs between Habitat management decisions, I think, is a big takeaway. Are you, are you getting out of this, Adam? Are you not going to give us your takeaway? Yeah, I was trying to think what my takeaway is. I have like a really, a really simple one. You two just gave wonderful responses. And I'm like, yeah, what you said. 
keep learning and uh, adjust your expectations and all that other stuff. So the, the other one that I'm thinking about is just like a totally uh, applied one from the episode with Dr. Harper where he was just like, I don't know, if you want to be a wildlife habitat person, just learn plants. Like, just go, like, just go. And we talked about that. Like, there's all these different disciplines. There's, there's policy and there's landscape ecology and there's animal behavior and like all this stuff. And I, and I think, you know, from an academic standpoint, we can kind of like, we can see those divisions um, and we see how people are parsing that information. But I don't think a typical landowner or land manager is thinking about, well, let me, let me apply this ecological principle to solving this challenge. What they're really doing is thinking, you know what? I observed something that told me something about the way the world works or the way the animal that I'm interested in managing is responding positively or negatively to something that I'm doing on the ground. And from that basic ecological observation, I'm going to make this next decision. I just, I like the really applied image of somebody out there tinkering and learning from doing on the land. So I think maybe my takeaway then after a little bit of rambling there is just simply get out there, observe these things, listen and learn and talk to your neighbors and talk to natural resource professionals and talk to read books and magazine articles and stuff and parse all that information. And then at the end of the day, this wildlife habitat management stuff is just awfully dang fun. And we're pretty lucky to get to do it either professionally or in our spare time or, or otherwise. So I'd say that's what I'm, that's what I'm thinking about now, 12 episodes into this thing. And I'm really looking forward, forward to the next 12 episodes, uh, exploring new things, talking to new specialists and, um, landowners and land managers and other academics uh, to think about advancing this really fun discipline that we're all lucky to be able to participate in that we call wildlife habitat management. Habitat University is hosted by Purdue Extension and Iowa State University Extension and Outreach and is part of the Natural Resources University podcast network. The network is supported by the Renewable Resources Extension Act. If you liked Habitat University, subscribe and listen to the other podcasts in the Natural Resources University podcast network. Iowa State University and Purdue University are equal opportunity, equal access, and affirmative action institutions.